Um, so I'd now like to introduce our speaker. Um, it's quite hard to know where to start. Professor Sir Roy Good is one of the most eminent commercial law professors in the world. Um, he was the Crowther Professor of Credit and Commercial Law at Queen Mary University of London, where he was the founder and first director of the Center for Commercial Law Studies. And he then became Professor of Commercial Law at the University of Oxford, and he's still an emeritus professor there. Now, I'm sure many of you will have come across his textbooks. Any of you who are studying now or have studied commercial law will probably have used his or be using his classic textbook on commercial law. And many of you will know his books, for example, on corporate insolvency and the book Legal Problems of Credit and Security, which, which I now edit. But he's written about many, many aspects of commercial law, both as regards English law and international law, and including transnational commercial law, and that is the subject of today's talk. Now, transnational commercial law takes many forms. Um, the strongest form, if you like, is, is a treaty, where a uniform law is set out in a convention and can be ratified and implemented by states. And there are very few private law conventions that could be said to be wildly successful. Uh, maybe uh, the Vienna Convention on the International Sale of Goods, which has 93 ratifications, uh, and the New York Convention on um, uh, uh, the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, um, that's got 166 uh, ratifications, but it has been around a very long time. And those two could be said to be two of the leading uh, ones, uh, with the third being the Cape Town Convention, which currently has 82 ratifications. So the success of the Cape Town Convention can be attributed largely to its design and to its text. And one of the chief architects of this was Professor Good, who was rapporteur for all the meetings and the conference leading to its adoption and was chair of the drafting committee. And when the convention was adopted, um, the diplomatic conference passed a resolution that there should be an official commentary on the convention and its protocols to aid in the use and interpretation of the treaty. And Professor Good was mandated to write uh, this official commentary. The official commentary for the convention and the aircraft protocol is now in its fourth edition. And Professor Good was also the rapporteur for the recent diplomatic conference which adopted the Pretoria Protocol and is now in the process, he is now in the process of finalizing the official commentary for that protocol. Now, you'll notice I haven't said anything about the subject matter of the Cape Town Convention and its protocols because Professor Good is going to tell you about that if you're not familiar with it. But I just wanted to let you know how fortunate we are to hear from probably the person who's been the most instrumental in formulating these instruments and in guiding their use in practice. And I should also add that the importance of these instruments is not just measured by the number of ratifications. Um, the Cape Town Convention and the Aircraft Protocol, which are in force, uh, they've enabled finance for aircraft to be obtained at favorable rates for very many years. And it's very much to be hoped that the Pretoria Protocol will do the same for equipment that is of vital importance, particularly in developing economies all over the world. So this is law designed to bring economic benefit, both from its content and from the uniformity that comes from its form as a treaty. So by now, I hope you've downloaded all the relevant documents and I will hand over to Professor Sir Roy Good to tell us about pits, plows and plants. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Louise. Um, um, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Um, I think it's fine. <laughs> I think it's fine. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, first of all, my thanks to Louise for her kind introduction. And secondly, um, a very good afternoon to you all. I'm only sorry that I'm not able to be with you in Cambridge, for those of you who are in Cambridge, but this is a case of force majeure. My talk, as Louise said, is on the Cape Town Convention on International Interests in Mobile Equipment and the um, protocol on mining, agricultural, and construction equipment. Now, I think you should have had some notes for this lecture. Let me tell you, I do not intend to go through these, which would be very tedious. They're an aid memoir. Uh, having said that, I am uh, an expert exponent of what uh, Hilaire Belloc once described in an essay as the art of boring people. So I'm going to try and exempt you from this. 
uh, and I will speak for 35 minutes so as to allow plenty of time for questions. This is an initiative of uh, UNIDRA, the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, uh, working on the Convention and for Aircraft Protocol with the International Civil Aviation Organization. UNIDRA is an international intergovernmental organization which uh, conducts studies into law affecting a number of jurisdictions to see whether there are difficulties uh, in the operation of these laws, which would make it desirable to try and harmonize them through a convention or model law or something of that kind. Um, like most institutions involved in this, not everything has been successful, but the Cape Town Convention Aircraft Protocol are 82 ratifications of the convention and 79 of the protocol, uh, together in each case with what was what is now the European Union. Let me try and give you an illustration of why this is necessary. Um, and uh, uh, it is because um, <clears throat> if I can take a case of aircraft financing, I'm not going to talk much about aircraft, but this illustrates it very well. You're financing an aircraft, say under English law, aircraft registered in England, you take a security interest, you register, everything is fine in England. But then suppose that this aircraft can fly all over the place. It may land in a country whose legal system is less developed, whose laws are very debtor, debtor friendly, and make it difficult to enforce. You don't quite know to what extent your interest will be recognized. And also you have no means of protecting your priority as against other grantees of a security interest because each country will apply its own law where the aircraft is situated to determine priority issues. So this is a great problem for creditors or intending creditors because they have to take a, an assessment of the risk involved. The more uncertainty, the higher the risk, and this will inhibit lending, particularly in developing countries. And even if the loan is made, it may be a lot more expensive uh, than would otherwise be the case. So this is what the Cape Town Convention protocols are about. They're about trying to, laying down uniform substantive law rules to regulate the creation and the perfection of registration and the priorities of international interests in mobile equipment. Um, and it's primarily concerned with equipment of a kind that is liable to be moving across national borders which is why you get the problem of different legal systems. And it is concerned with high value equipment and equipment that is uniquely identifiable. The reason for the uniquely identifiable being that the convention, having provided for the constitution of an international interest, which I'll explain in a moment, also provides basic default remedies and an international registry to register your interest. The international registry is asset based, not debtor based. So people who want to know if there's an interest have to search the register and have to, um, and they, they do so against the asset, which means that for registration purposes, every item of equipment in which you take an international interest has to be uniquely identifiable, typically by serial number supported by supplementary information. That's the way the thing works. Um, and so the convention uh, lays down these rules supported by protocol uh, for creation, perfection, priority of international interests and they are the, and, and also safeguards for the creditor against the event of the debtor's insolvency. Um, 
All that is, uh, I think, quite clear. What is an international interest? An international interest is basically uh, an interest granted to a chargee under a security agreement or held by a person who is conditional seller under a title reservation agreement or a lessor under a leasing agreement. Those are the three things that are covered. The convention itself covers aircraft objects, railway rolling stock, space assets, satellites and things like that, and now mining, agricultural and construction equipment. Um, harmonization is a difficult process uh, because the people involved in it come from any number of different legal systems, belong to different legal families. So you have the common law, the civil law, Scandinavian legal, legal system, uh, legal family, I should say, uh, and so on. So how does one go about it? Uh, one way would be to go for the lowest common denominator and try and find out what it is that's common to all these systems. That would be a rather futile exercise, and that's not the way it is done. The way it is done is to identify the practical problems created by these differences in national legal systems, and then uh, to come up with legal rules which answer these these problems, in other words, practical solutions, the so-called functional approach. And when that happens, people from a number of different legal systems find they can reach agreement on rules, bypassing any doctrinal differences, don't really matter um, for the most part. You just come up with a rule which solves the problem. This involves being very creative and um, and meeting all sorts of apparently impenetrable obstacles. It can be a good thing because then you're forced to raise your game and come up with creative solutions. It's not so different if you're studying for doctorate and you come up with intractable problems, then you have to raise your game and, and jump over them. Now, um, one of the problems that's affected all these instruments is how to define the subject matter, whether it's aircraft, railway, or any sort of what have you, in order to limit it to types of item that are high value and uniquely identifiable. Um, and sometimes this is difficult. Uh, space assets, for example, satellites are in outer space, uh, and they may be identified possibly by a serial number, but you won't be able to see them. Uh, from, uh, uh, from the ground. So another, a solution has to be found for that. With Mac equipment, uh, there was a really intractable problem, as it seemed, because we don't want to cover every shovel or spade. We want to limit this to high value. We want to limit it to equipment that has a serial number. A lot of this type of equipment does not have a serial number, or else the same serial number applies to different types of equipment. So um, how to deal with this? Now, the, um, the money agricultural the Unidraft study group, uh, supported by an industry working group, came up with a very clever solution. They said, look, the World Customs Organization publishes something like 5,244 code classification. The code, what the code does, is to classify for customs purposes almost every kind of equipment you can think of. So this what we'll do is to select 56 of these codes being codes that are indicative of high value, unique registration by serial number. Actually, the serial number is only needed for registration. It doesn't matter when it comes to the agreement between the parties. They can agree on any, any type of um, description that would, for example, be in conformity with English law. So you could take security over just classes by description. You could take security over present and after acquired dealers inventory and so on. It is only for registration that this is required. Now, the uh, protocol contains three annexes respectively for mining, agricultural and constructive 
and construct, so mining, agriculture, and construction equipment. Of course, I'm only concerned with um, the agricultural equipment. It is open to a contracting state to exclude the conventional protocol in relation to one or two of these. But there are codes that are common to all three. And in that case, if a code which has been excluded uh, in A and B, for example, uh, then uh, is found in the third in the third annex, then the, the uh, exclusion will not prevent the application of the convention. Well, let me just pause a moment to say that um, I will get this free. I'm sorry, to say that um, you can receive my lecture in either of two ways, uh, for which my students used to use my book on commercial law. Right? One is you use it as an instruction, you listen to as instruction. The other is, like my students told me, as an infallible cure for insomnia. One page and you're up. Um, so, if you feel the eyelids closing, uh, may I urge you to yield to temptation and um, and just uh, uh, and just fall off? And I will give it a shout when I get to the end. Um, the only thing I would say is that this can be a problem. I, I, the sense of ennui can cross to the other side of the desk, especially if you've been giving the identical lecture for 20 years. And I, I had a colleague once who had a dream. He dreamt he was giving a lecture and then he woke up and discovered he was. So you can see we have our problems too. Now, let me, uh, I'm only going to concern myself, we haven't got much time, with three issues on the MAC problem. One is the concept of immovable associated equipment, because of all the categories of equipment covered by the four protocols, mining, agriculture, and construction equipment are the most likely to have the prospect of becoming attached to land. Then the question is, what happens? What is the effect? The second thing I want to deal with is inventory. That is to say, the application of the protocol to stock which is held by a dealer for the purpose of sale or leasing, that sort of thing, in the ordinary course of business. And the third thing is the relevance of this protocol, particularly to subsistence farming, for example, in cases, in cases like Africa and so on. So let me take immovable associated equipment. This is defined uh, in um, um, Article 1, 2, K of the protocol as equipment that is so associated with immovable property that an interest in the immovable property extends to the equipment under the law of the state in which the immovable property is situated. This doesn't actually indicate any priority rule of any kind is purely there as a definition and the substantive provision will be found in article 7 of the uh, of the protocol um, and um, article 7 um, which I can only touch on briefly is the following situation the first first is where the removable associated equipment is located in a non-contracting state. Of course, in that situation, um, the rights of the holder of the removal interest are not affected at all. Then there's the case of what happens if the removal property is situated in a contracting state, let's say one who is a party to the convention and this protocol. And there, um, there are three options. A contracting state can choose alternative A, alternative B, alternative C. Alternative A deals with the case where the immovable associated equipment is severable 
from the immovable property. Um, that's all turned to vain. And uh, what is said there is that where it is severable, I'll talk about what that means in a moment, where it is severable, then the association with immovable property does not affect the application of the convention of the protocol to the international interest, which includes creation, existence, priority, and so on. So the international interest is not affected in those cases where the equipment can be severed. And that means it can be severed only if it's estimated value after physical dis disconnection of the equipment from the removal property would be greater than the estimated cost of the disconnection and of any restoration of the removal property. So that's all turned to that. In other words, provided it's economic to take the equipment away, to, to detach it from the land of building, then your interest is not affected. So this is a, an economic test, not a legal test. Um, that's alternative, um, that's basically alternative A. And there's a rebuttable presumption that if it was severable at the beginning, then it's going to continue to be several. Alternative B is different. This is a legal based one, it's not an economic test. It does not affect the application of any law of the state where immovable property is situated that determines whether the international interest in immovable property, associated property can't be created or has been lost and so on because of the attachment. So you simply apply, or you allow to apply the law governing the immovable property. So far, it's all quite straightforward. I hope everybody is following so far. We shall see, we shall hear soon enough if anybody's got any problems with that. Um, and then after that, we have as part of alternative, uh, uh, that's alternative B. Um, and then there's a, an addition proposed really by the German delegation and accepted that where the equipment has not lost its individual legal identity, then um, in accordance with the law of the state where the removal property is situated, um, the, the um, holder of the interest in the removal property only has priority if two conditions are fulfilled. One is the interest in the removal property has been registered in accordance with requirements of domestic law. The second is the equipment became associated with the removal property prior to the time of registration of the international interest in the equipment. And the alternative C says protocol does not affect the application of any law of the state that determines where the, where, where the removal property is situated, doesn't affect. So those are the things. Now, the priority rules, I should explain. We have the convention create, provides for the creation of international interest. And, and it's, it provides for default remedies and it provides for registration. And the registration is key because the basic priority rule and all the priority rules except for assignments are in one article. We're quite proud of that one article because it's we went for simplicity rather than subtlety and complexity a registered international interest has priority over a subsequently registered international interest or over an unregistered international interest whether it is registrable or not very very strong priority rule and then we have provisions in the protocol based on those of the aircraft protocol, which give the, if applied by a contracting state, give the credit of very powerful enforcement remedies. In other words, what they basically do is to say, the debtor or the insolvency administrator in the event of insolvency has a waiting period as declared by a contracting state within which to remedy all defaults, cure uh, and undertake to perform future obligations 
if that doesn't happen um, within the waiting period, then the predator can repossess. No court can intervene, intervene to stop the repossession or to modify the debtor's obligations in any way at all. Very, very strong remedy. But the um, Cape Town Convention its protocols really blazed a trail in many ways. They broke through all sorts of taboos. First, you have this new animal, the international interest, created by security or under a title reservation agreement or lease agreement, which does not derive from national law. It is purely a function of the convention. And then we are invading areas previously regarded as taboo because it was thought that <clears throat> they were too sensitive in terms of local jurisdictions. So property rights, always regarded as taboo. How can we get into property rights? Well, this convention does and does so in a big way. How can we get into priority rights? Again, it does so, as I say in this one article. Then the next thing is, I said, well, there are certain provisions which sense contracting states may be very sensitive about. They might run counter to their fundamental legal philosophy. So there's an elaborate system of declarations by which you can, um, by which uh, a state can um, opt out, or indeed it will not be bound unless it opts in by a declaration to a particular provision. Thirdly, we've got the two instrument approach, and this is a, a very interesting, where the convention does not operate as regards any class of equipment until there's a protocol relating to that equipment. What is unusual is the protocol controls the convention. The convention can't come to force until the protocol is in force, and the protocol can override the convention. This, I think, is pretty unique, but it's a very, very useful uh, feature. So we have all these trailblazing rules, and they're partly, I think, um, the reason why the Convention and the Aircraft Protocol have been so successful. The only one currently in force, Luxembourg will likely come into force um, during the course of next year, and space, space is more difficult. Railway running, um, and, and so that, that's how things are going. Now, um, let me come back to subsistence farming and the relevance of this um, the relevance of this protocol to subsistence farming, particularly in uh, uh, countries like Africa. Well, I say countries in continents like Africa. The a study by the F um, Food and Agricultural Organization 2016 said that um, African farm systems were the least mechanized for all, over all continents. Uh, farming in sub-Sahara, they said, was almost entirely subsistence farming. In other words, the farmers would grow enough, just about enough, to keep themselves and their family alive, but no spare over to, to keep as a sort of storage for a rainy day, or to sell. And the main reason for this is that the farmers could not afford the cost of modern farming tools. They could not afford the cost of, um, for example, bulldozers, tractors, plows, threshers. All had to be done by hand and by hoe. So the idea is that this will, protocol will help to promote finance by giving creditors greater confidence, greater security, open up finance, they will be able to buy this equipment, they'll be able to farm more effectively um, and uh, produce much more, maybe have enough to be able to actually market uh, the spare produce and so on. There was an economic impact assessment done. Uh, they said that Mac equipment accounts for roughly $100 billion worth a year in world trade, and that the protocol could increase stock of Mac equipment by $90 billion over 10 years. That, that's sort of serious uh, 
serious investment. So that is a, a very brief outline. The, the road to success in these things is very, very hard. You had to be patient and you have to persevere. Cape Town was pretty fast as things go. It took something like um, four and a half years from the time of the time of the convention of aircraft possible to the kind that's coming into force. But of course, the lead time before that was quite long. It, all the things started in 1988. So it took 13 years to get to the adoption of the convention of aircraft protocol, and another four and a half years before it came into force. The Luxembourg Protocol requiring four ratifications, after 13 years still only has three, but the fourth is imminent. Um, and space has got nowhere very far, not because there's anything wrong with it, but because there's a little oligarchy, which is very happy with, being, with its oligarchic position, does not want to make it easier for other people to come into the market. So now I'm sort of just about coming to the end of my time. And I have been um, very conscious of time since I heard about Lord Denning, uh, who was presiding in Port of Peel over a case in which uh, the advocate was going on and on and on, the advocate for one of the parties, um, impervious to the increase, increasing tappings of the judicial pencil, of the judicial pencil and the in, increasingly increasing frowns on the judicial brow. But eventually it occurred to him, thick as he was, that maybe he was going on a bit long. So he said to Lord Denning, my Lord, I hope I have not exceeded my time. And Lord Denning looked down and he said in that Hampshire burr that I can't replicate, time, Mr. Smith, he said, time, you have exhausted time and trespassed on eternity. I don't want to do that, so I'm stopping. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Roy. Um, <clears throat> one of the weird things about these webinars is that, you know, you have, uh, you have no idea, you can't see people laughing, you can't see people reacting, but I'm sure everyone's laughing at, at, at your last remarks and some of, some of your other jokes. Um, now, I would like very much to urge people to ask questions, to make comments. Um, I, I see from the attendees that I think we have some people who probably know a bit about the Cape Town Convention and for others it may be uh, totally new. And particularly, I see some of the, um, uh, my students in the commercial law group, commercial law course, for whom um, security, the concept of security is, is quite new because we haven't quite got onto that yet. So I'm going to be doing the lectures for that uh, over the next week or so uploading those. So we, we have people for, for whom this is all extremely new and I can see that it may be, may be a bit confusing, but I would urge you to um, ask some questions. You have to type them in the Q&A so that I can see them and then I can ask you to, 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 to speak to them. So please, if you could think about some questions and do that because this is a great opportunity for you to ask. Um, at the moment, we don't have any questions. So while you're thinking of them, um, maybe Roy, you did say that you would um, say a few words about inventory under the um, Pretoria. Oh, yes. And it might be, while everyone, and I do urge you to think of your questions, but while they're thinking of questions, perhaps you'd like to just say a few words about that. Well, quite right. It's advancing years, you know. One gets more and more forgetful. Um, I'm so forgetful that I once went back to the house, went up this familiar street, we'd moved house. But I went back to the original house, rang the front door while I had no key. Strange woman opened the door. I said, excuse me. I said politely, what are you doing in my house? She said equally politely, well, Mr. Good, you remember we bought your house three months ago. So this is one of my problems. Inventory, you're quite right. Um, now, um, generally speaking, the uh, asset-based registration system works well. Not so good for inventory and say dealer's stock. Because, first of all, a dealer can stop a large number of items of inventory. So it's giving a security interest 
and you have to have unique identification of each asset, you get a multiplicity of registrations, which is very cumbersome. Not only that, but the registrations are likely to be temporary. The security interests are likely to be temporary uh, because they will disappear as items of inventory are sold, which is the purpose which they held or leased. And therefore, you'd have to have a multiplicity of discharges of registration very soon after the registration has been made. So that's why the uh, protocol allows a contracting state to make a declaration excluding most of the convention as regards inventory and in particular the registration and priority rules, therefore enabling it instead to use their own database registration systems where the problem of individual individualization doesn't arise. You can just file against the data, cover all present and future inventory and so on. That I think is probably all I needed to say about there are there are some other things, but I mean that that's the essence of it. Thank you, Louise, for reminding me. Well, I must say that you know I remember very well I was involved in all of this as well. That that was one of the most difficult areas we had to deal with, and of course it isn't really the, a problem one has to deal with with aircraft. You don't have a an aircraft shop, but you could have a tractor shop, and that was why you had the tractor dealership, and that's why we had this this issue.